Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show. If you've had a scary experience at work, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit so we can narrate it. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Whoa, Turbo, uh, don't exit the cafe so fast. You scared the living daylights out of me. Oh, why am I so jumpy? Uh, just thinking about one of the scariest ghost stories I've ever heard recently. Something about a thing you can't see or touch being able to mess with you really freaks me out. You want to hear it? Actually, I've got a load of new scary work stories to tell you today. The other closing shift guy, Booze and Booze, will be joining me to share these stories today. So let's clock out for a while. These are tales from the break room. From Down the Hallway From S.C. I've always enjoyed scary stories about the unknown and supernatural, but I don't scare easily. I'm a skeptic who believes there is a rational, scientific explanation for anything, even if we don't fully understand what that explanation is yet. I understand the human mind can cause us to mistake objects for other things, and it is not much of a stretch to believe that anyone can be tricked into seeing or hearing things that aren't actually there. I want to believe in the supernatural, though, because it makes the world a more interesting, mysterious place, and I have had one experience where my skeptical beliefs were challenged. When I was a college student in my last year of school during the late 90s, I had a part-time job caring for a young woman. Her name was Lily. She was significantly disabled due to a rare genetic disorder. Although she was only a couple of years younger than I was, she could not walk, talk, or feed herself, and she was also blind. Developmentally, she was about at the level of a six-month-old. She lived with her parents. Her father worked, and her mother had devoted the last 20 years to staying at home and caring for Lily. They used the county agency I worked for to provide care for Lily when they needed a break or had business to attend to. I enjoyed working for the family. The dad was quiet, but Lily's mom was very friendly and accommodating. Despite her disabilities, Lily was relatively easy to care for. She loved listening to music and watching cartoons. She liked to play in water, and she enjoyed going for walks in her wheelchair. Physically, though, she hadn't grown much past 50 pounds, which was about the upper limits of what I was capable of lifting. But I could lift her as needed when I had to get her in and out of the car, or her wheelchair, or haul her up the long flight of stairs in the house when I had to put her to bed. I'd been working as Lily's caregiver for several months when Lily's parents wanted to go away overnight to visit her brother, who was attending college several hours away. Now I was familiar with Lily's bedtime routine, and for this day, my duties would remain the same, except that I would sleep over and get overtime pay for the night hours, which seemed like a pretty good deal to me. The family also had a friendly, rambunctious Labrador retriever named Mitzi, and even though I didn't mind her, they decided to board her at a kennel while they were out, so I would have one less hassle during my time there. They offered to let me stay in the master bedroom, which had a television and its own bathroom, but I told them I was fine just staying in the guest room. The guest bedroom was at the top of the stairs, and a bathroom was across the hall from it. To the left of the guest room was the master bedroom as well as Lily's room. To the right was another bedroom and an office. The house was a well-maintained, newer colonial. There was nothing particularly old or creepy about it. That day, my boyfriend dropped me off, taking the car we shared, and Lily's mom showed me all the food she'd bought for Lily and me to eat. She and her husband said their goodbyes, and I proceeded to feed Lily her dinner. Afterwards, slowly and steadily, I lugged her up the long staircase to get her ready for bed. I gave Lily her bath, which she enjoyed as usual, then got her dressed and tucked into her bed. 
she wasn't really capable of moving much, but she slept surrounded by a ring of pillows to guard against the off chance that she might kick her legs and roll over. I secured her in her pillow nest, wound up her music box, then turned off the light, retiring to the guest bedroom to read, leaving both of our bedroom doors cracked slightly open so I could hear what was going on. Lily giggled occasionally to herself while the music box played its tinkling tune. Her echoing chuckles in the nearly empty dark house were a little unnerving, honestly. Was she enjoying the music? Or were there other thoughts in her head that would forever be unknown? The music slowed, then eventually it came to a stop, but the giggles continued to emanate from her room periodically, mingling with the familiar pops and squeaks that any house will make as the evening cools it down. I'd been reading and listening to these sounds for about half an hour, when I suddenly heard a different sound. It was coming from the far end of the hallway by the office. Creak, then silence. Then I heard it again, creak, followed by silence, then creak. It sounded so much like someone was trying to walk slowly down the hall, but they would pause every time their step made a noise, a creak. My nerves were on edge. I just stared at my book. What could possibly be making that noise? Maybe it was time for me to go to sleep, I thought. Lily was an early riser. I turned out my light and shut my eyes. Creak. The noise seemed closer this time. I opened my eyes, noticing a sliver of light coming in through the slightly open door to my room. What was that? I got up and slowly peered out into the hallway. A light came from Lily's room. I felt pretty certain that I had turned her light off, but maybe I hadn't, I thought. I mean, what other explanation could there be? Nervously, I walked down the hallway into her room, and when I pushed open the door to her room, I saw that Lily was still tucked in her nest of pillows, exactly as I had left her but her bedside lamp was now turned on. A wave of fear and shock washed over me. Sure, there was a slight chance that I could have left the overhead light on accidentally, but I had never, ever used that lamp before. As far as I had known, it was only decorative. I was certain I had not turned that light on, nor was Lily capable of getting to it, much less turning it on. I was unsure what my next move should be. Should I try to bring Lily downstairs? But want then? She'd be upset if I got her out of bed. And if someone or something were to try to pursue us while I carried her on the stairs, we'd either be caught or we'd plummet down them. Should I call the police? I hadn't heard or seen anything concrete enough to really warrant calling them, and I didn't want to seem flighty or irresponsible. I didn't want to call Lily's parents either and ruin their trip. What to do? I decided that Lily would be safest where she was for the time being, so I turned off her lamp and left her with her door cracked open again. I didn't have a phone, but I knew the house had two cordless ones. One of them was in the office down the hall, but I didn't want to go in there. So I went downstairs to the kitchen to call my boyfriend and ask him to come over. He and I shared an apartment across town. I dialed the number and got a busy signal, so I tried again about a minute later. But the same thing happened. Now, we had the most basic of phone plans with no call waiting. I still was worried there might be someone in the house, and I also didn't want to leave Lily alone upstairs for too long, so I brought the cordless phone upstairs with me trying to reach my boyfriend every five minutes or so, but getting a busy signal every time. After about the tenth attempt, I gave up trying to reach him. Maybe our phone was off the hook. I still hadn't heard or seen anything else, so maybe I didn't need him anyway. I turned out my light to try to get some sleep, but really I was just listening to every sound the house made. 
Lily giggled. The house settled. Then there it was again. Creak. I held my breath. Was I just imagining it? Creak. It was coming from the end of the hall by the office again, getting slightly closer. Creak. A pause, then whoomph. It sounded as if someone had dumped out a basket of clothing right outside the guest room door. I shot straight up in bed as my mind scrambled for a logical explanation for this new sound. The bathroom where I'd given Lily her bath was right across the hallway. Maybe the big bath towel I'd used had fallen off the bar and made that sound. That could explain it, but if the towel had fallen, I steeled my nerves and got up to investigate. I stepped into the bathroom and turned on the light. The towel was still hanging where I'd left it. I sprinted down the stairs until I reached the bottom, then stood with my back against the front door, looking up them. I called out, I know you're up there. I have a phone. I'm going to call 911. I suggest you leave now. I heard nothing in response. With my back still at the door, I called my boyfriend again, and finally he picked up. He'd been using our phone the whole time, catching up with an old high school friend. I begged him to come over as soon as possible, and within 15 minutes or so, he arrived, finding me still standing by the door. In our relationship, he's usually the one more easily scared, so I think he relished the chance to go through the upstairs, turning on the lights, and looking in closets. He hadn't heard what I'd heard, and I assumed I was just getting spooked by the house settling. But a settling house doesn't turn on lamps. I myself was pretty convinced that a person had been in the house, and that he would find an open window or an attic door showing evidence of an intruder. But he found nothing at all. I convinced him to stay the night, just in case. By this point, I was pretty emotionally drained, and it wasn't too hard to fall asleep, though I swear I heard one more faint creak just as I was drifting off. I asked my boyfriend then if he had heard it, but he'd already fallen asleep himself. The next morning, Lily's mother called to see how things had gone. I didn't want her to think I was crazy, nor did I want to lose this job that paid relatively well, so I told her that things were great. Although I did ask, Have you heard anything strange at night here? I heard some weird noises, but I'm sure it was nothing. She paused, just long enough for me to tell the question had taken her off guard. She didn't immediately laugh or dismiss my comment. Oh, maybe. That's just the house. I'm sure it was nothing. The hesitancy of her tone made me think that maybe she did know what I was talking about. Either that, or she was questioning my reliability. But it probably wasn't that, since I was asked to stay overnight a few more times over the next year. Yeah, I did agree to stay there again, but after that I took them up on their offer to stay in the master bedroom. From there, I could leave the TV on all night to drown out any background noises, and I left the bathroom and hallway lights on too. I also asked them to leave their dog Mincy with me. She was way too friendly to be of any use as a guard dog, but her presence made me feel much safer anyway. I also splurged on call waiting for our phone plan, too. Did I hear anything after that? I had to be able to hear if Lily was crying in her room, but I had the TV loud to cover as much noise as possible otherwise. I'm pretty sure those hallway sounds were still there, but I didn't allow myself to focus on them. Mitzi never barked or growled at anything, but would occasionally stare at the door leading to the hall and cock her head to the side. Before long, I graduated, and I got a job out of state. But my sister was looking for work at the time, so she took over the job of looking after Lily for me. I had told her the story of my night of fright when it happened, and when it came time for her to stay there overnight, I was curious to hear what happened to her. 
My sister called me the day after her first day. She'd heard those footsteps in the hallway, exactly as I had described them, but nothing, no one had been there. She kept herself from being too scared by coming up with a theory. Although Lily's body and mind had not developed, it was clear she still had a lot of spirit. Maybe at night, while her body and mind slept, her spirit roamed free throughout the house. It was as good an explanation as any. There's a disappearing woman at my university. From Cleaning Crew. During the time the story takes place, I was and still am a member of the facility services for a university that will remain nameless. That's a polite and encompassing term for cleaner, even though it also includes the frequent migration of classroom and laboratory hardware that isn't leased, mostly desks and chairs. The nature of my position effectively guaranteed exclusive night shifts, and that is something I very much appreciated at the time I was hired for a few reasons. I have an ocular condition called pars planitis. It's something I was born with, aside from my right eye being no better in visual acuity than the camera lens of an early 2000s flip phone. It guarantees a whole other fun host of features. Cascading eye floaters, visual snow, blue entropic field, and extreme sensitivity to light are among the most prevalent. This effectively guarantees I'm always wearing sunglasses rain, shine, early morning, or late afternoon. The only exception is, of course, at night. That fact led me to appreciating my evening shifts so much more. While I do have horrendous streaking astigmatism in both lenses, it's the most bearable of all symptoms. So being out at night is my jam. Not to say I can perfectly see in the evening. It's still hard in some environments. That's why when I first saw it, I assumed it was nothing more than a visual distortion. The sight was so hard to explain. I was cleaning in a lab, one far larger than most as it sat below the library, and had one open access computers for all students. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement, brief and adjusting, like a person watching me. I thought it was a person anyway. It was near the end of the semester, and it's 10 o'clock at night. It's very atypical to see a student at that time, but nevertheless, I looked over. As I did, my eyes trailed after the sight, bizarrely finding nothing awaiting them. Of course, I didn't think much of it. Just another visual distortion. Nothing new under the fluorescent lights mounted to the high ceilings of the lab. Off I went, sanitizing workstations. This was back when the pandemic had struck, so it had to be done daily. And we even had a checklist with each computer station's ID to mark off as we went. So that's what I was focused on, not paying much mind at all. Maybe 10 minutes later though, I saw it again, roughly the same shape, the same height, and just out of the corner of my eye. Someone was watching me, only this time from the opposite side of the room. I followed it, even quicker than before, only to see it disappear. That's when I began to suspect my eyesight was finding another way to mess with my perception. And so I gave my face a quick rub, debating on an early drop of my anti-inflammatory prescription. Just as I took my hands away from my face though, I saw something. Up in front of me, where I thought the person had been, was a cigarette on the floor. At this distance, my vision could barely resolve it. But as I approached, it turned out to be exactly what I had thought. I can't tell you much about it, other than the fact that it had been dragged on. It sat halfway burned, idly against the ground. I was positive that it had been there when I'd come in. I knew it for a fact, regardless. I took a gloved hand and trashed the item. As I did so, I picked up on a very light scent of smoke, as if it had been burning 10 or 20 minutes prior, combined with another lighter floral aroma like that of a perfume. When I came home early that morning following that evening shift, I was anxious. Really? I thought my condition had gotten worse, and I was emotionally preparing myself to have to deal with these new distortions. It's never fun when you gain a new, consistent problem with your vision. I was practicing to see if they'd occur again, emulating the same light levels and flicks of my head to see if my eyes would produce the look of someone watching me just out of the corner of my eye. To my appreciation, they didn't. 
I wondered if it was the fluorescent lights unique to the university, or even the lab, that were triggering it. I seemed to find out otherwise, as I started my shift the following evening. After collecting and running trash from the bins out to the dumpster outside of one of the campus buildings, I noticed it again. This time, it was under the cover of night. Only a high-set parking lot light illuminated the general darkness. Instead of snapping my eyes over to it only for it to disappear, I handled the garbage slowly. Instead, choosing to observe it in the periphery of my vision like one would a floater in your own vision. As I focused, it became clear that I was looking at a very legitimate person. At least, it so appeared. They were dressed in white primarily, though I couldn't tell much of their skin tone or features from the corner of my vision. And no less, they were smoking. The plumes of subtle fog that were blowing into my field of vision made it clear. Confident that someone was absolutely positively there, I snapped my head over, only to see no one. Nothing. Not so much as a whisper of anything ever even being there. Awestruck, I moved over to where they precisely were, against an adjacent building, just outside an exit that was maybe 30 feet from my original position. I could barely make out the hot vapor of a cigarette moving against the night air, and as I looked down, there was another cigarette on the ground. The same brand as the lab from the previous evening. I picked it up, with glove on mind you, and examined it under the light of the faraway street lamp. It appeared to be the same brand as the one I'd thrown away the night prior, having only a few drags taken off the end. Most notably though, there was a visible shade of lipstick planted at the end of the filter. It was comical really. The deep red mark was incredibly tangible, as if the woman who was smoking it had been wearing a very thick layer of gloss. Now, like anyone would, I assumed the cigarette had been there from before. That's what I would have thought too, were it not for the faint trace of heat that I could detect even through my gloved fingers, as if hot smoke had just been dragging through it. I continued my shift distracted, put on music as I worked my way about campus, my playlist doing little to ease my wandering mind. I knew now that these were no ocular distortions. I was seeing someone, even if it was just out of the corner of my eye. Someone was there, a woman I guessed given the lipstick, and they had an affinity for cigarettes. And yet somehow, whenever I turned my periphery and looked directly toward them, they'd vanish, leaving only their addictive vice behind. As the night bore on, it happened on two more occasions. The first, I actively studied them, just seeing how far I could get to them in the center of my vision before they would decide to vanish. I tilted my head slowly, and on the tiny medium that divided an abstract humanoid made up of colors to a feature-rich individual, they disappear. It was simply frustrating. So, the second time I saw them, which was inside a near vacant hallway, I tried something different. I approached them, slowly. I kept my blurry corner vision on them, but moved forward. Slowly I neared feeling ridiculous all the while I guessed it was someone messing with me. And when I was no more than 10 feet away, I stopped, deciding to speak and say hello. I listened quietly for a response, focusing on my hearing tightly. I picked up on a quiet idle sound, paper, tobacco, and any other accessory additives being burned. There was absolutely, positively someone right there, smoking. I could smell it too. I stepped forward being sure not to change where they were in my field of view. And I said hello again. I was right next to them now, and I could feel the oxygen I breathed being afflicted by their smoke, and the acidic burn becoming quite uncomfortable. Evidently, the person was ignoring me, still grossly fixated on their indoor cigarette. I felt incredibly ridiculous, especially because I wasn't so much as facing them, only observing them through my periphery, Confident now that there was no way that they could slip out of my vision, I turned my head, both eager and anxious to see who was waiting for me. But as I did, I was met with the blank wall. The space the person had been leaning against was vacant. However, close as I was, I did catch the sight of a still-lit cigarette falling to the floor of the hallway. Dumbfounded and upset, I stomped on it, putting it out as I considered what had just happened. As the smoke faded away, there was still the tinge of a somehow outdated smelling perfume on the air. 
The rest of the night after that was terrible. Now confident that it wasn't my vision playing tricks on me, I shuddered to think of the other remaining possibilities. Was I delusional? It seemed the most logical. My hours were tame, but still long, and my sleep schedule was at an all-time low in terms of health. But even so, I had seen these cigarettes. Those were tangible. I remember looking down on one occasion, propping my foot up to see the bottom of the shoe's sole was stained and ashy. For the rest of the evening, I wrestled with my thoughts, consciously avoiding focus of anything in my periphery, so as not to repeat the bizarre occurrence of someone disappearing right in front of me. This new way of how I looked at things continued as my shifts went on. I found myself adopting my all-too-familiar sunglasses at night, using them as guides and ensuring I paid no mind to anything outside of my field of view that the lenses offered. It did work well enough to relax me, at least for a while. Whether it was that state or the simple passage of time that caused the next progression to occur, I'm still unsure. One evening, as I was actively minding my own business and sweeping under the tables, back in that same computer lab below the library, I looked up to see one perfectly observable in the dead set of my vision. And they were smoking. It was a woman. She was Asian, with mid-length black hair and glasses even thicker than my own. The most atypical thing about her was the lab coat she wore, bizarrely bright white, that caused my pupils to dilate just observing it even from under the sunglasses. She was leaned against the far wall of the lab, looking at me and drawing on her cigarette. At the time, I didn't immediately draw a line between her and the strange experience I'd had a few nights prior, so I wasn't quite on edge. With a rather aggressive tone, I asked her what she thought she was doing smoking indoors. She made no indication that she heard me, instead dragging on her smoke once more. And so I stepped forward, opting to walk over to her so that she'd be forced to acknowledge me. Somehow though, in the brief split second it took my eyes to close and reopening following a blink, she had vanished. Just like before, only this time, it was even more surreal. She was dead center in my vision, not at the corner, and yet, she dematerialized completely and utterly. My eyes opened quick enough to spot the still lit cigarette dropping to the floor, just like I'd seen already. That was the last straw for me. I was done for that evening. I left early, stepping on the cigarette and crushing it into the floor without bothering to clean the residue. The frustration I felt combined with the eerie sense of uncertainty in my own senses was far too crippling to work with, and so home I went informing my coworkers in the group chat that I wasn't feeling well while avoiding anything too specific. During my walk, I logged onto my medical clinic's website, making an appointment with my GP about hallucinations, as I had no confidence left in myself. Once I was finished, I remember putting the phone back into my pocket, only to take it out a second later as I felt it vibrate. I checked the notification. It was a message in my team Slack. That very same chat I used to inform them that I was leaving early for the night. It was sent by a coworker I barely knew, and even so, the content chilled me. It read the following. Who was the girl in utility? Being the first to see it, I immediately asked for clarification as to what they meant. My coworker then went on to indicate that they had walked into one of our larger utility rooms where we keep carts and cleaning supplies. As they did so, a woman who looked exactly like the one I'd seen was exiting the room from the other side. Keep in mind, our rooms were all key carded. Granted, there were a few people that had access aside from our little team, security mostly. But even so, it was extremely rare to see someone there, especially so late at night. Hesitantly, I asked if they were smoking, only for them to confirm that the rancid air of cigarettes was very present in that small room. The next day as my shift began, I conferred with my coworker and we both went to the central utility where they saw her. Once they finished telling their story once more, they began to mention that they thought they'd seen her before too, but not in the same capacity that I had. She'd only ever been exiting room that belonged to facilities or turning corners and actively heading away from my coworkers. I felt a new sense of security knowing that I wasn't the only one seeing this apparition as I came to start coining her as. Even despite our sightings being different, 
That classification was a unique stretch for me to make. I'm generally a pretty rational person, and yet, there weren't many conclusions I could draw beyond that. Whoever this bizarre woman was that seemed incessant on chain smoking and following around the nighttime facility's crew, she'd exhibited a vanishing act superior to that of Houdini, and I wasn't the only one who'd seen it in action. In all honesty, I found myself excited as my shift began. My coworker and I both opted to share with each other if we saw the strange woman again, and so my insecurity had more or less erased itself. I was curious to see if I could find out more about the strange character. My work had taken on a new energy, one where I was much more attentive to detail and aware of ambient noises. Each stray floater in my vision I investigated, curious to see if it was the strange woman hanging out of the corner of my vision. Surprisingly though, for most of the majority of that night, no such event occurred. I was surprised, fully expecting I'd see them even if ever so briefly at some point. As I was running multiple bags of trash out to the dumpster, I felt my phone buzz and I checked it as my hands became free. It was my coworker, leaving me a message to come to the basement floor of one of the campus buildings. Basement floors were generally rare and only present on two of our old installations. Before I could even ask why, another message appeared on my screen saying that they were pretty sure she's here. So off I went, intrigued. I felt the pressure in my chest build as I became anxious, but ignored it. It was far less than my excitement in seeing the mysterious girl. I entered the building, moving down a large hallway before reaching the stairs and following the left flight down. Arriving at the bottom, I was met with a large double door and my coworker waiting on the outside of it. The area was a tight hallway, the only opening behind the door in question. Inside was illuminated with a white yellow glow, the type synonymous with industrial lighting systems from decades past. Admittedly, I didn't know what the door led to. I'd never needed to come down here before, and by the look on my coworker's face, I'm guessing they hadn't either. Quickly, I asked them about the text they had sent me, and they informed me that while running trash outside of the building, they narrowly caught the strange woman heading down the stairs that I had just come down. Apparently, they followed her right away, repeatedly asking for her attention, even despite her refusing to stop. Then they'd arrive at the door we both were at now, where they'd messaged me from. When I asked them if they knew whether our key rings worked or not, they advised me to listen first. Confused, I did, hearing nothing for a few seconds. But then, a voice became audible, that of a mature woman, a crisp voice with a heavy accent who sounded visibly angry as if she was arguing with someone. It was coming from the other side of the door, somewhere in the stone-walled, hazily lit room. I asked them if they thought that that was a strange woman and they nodded, seemingly positive that it was. Intently, we both listened, and though most of the words were hard to hear through the door, the way her voice moved up and down octaves indicated her conversation was personal and emotional. It grew more and more heated, up until she screamed a loud curse and followed up with a smash, as if she'd broken the phone she was talking on. I was actually a little concerned about intruding on whoever might be in there, even if it was that bizarre woman. But my coworker had other ideas. Quickly, they whipped out their key ring, using the key default for the building on the deadbolt. It worked seamlessly, and the door swung open with a creak. They entered, and I followed behind them. Quickly, it became clear that the tight's room hazy appearance wasn't due to the lighting, but in actuality, the cigarette smoke. In a space no bigger than a washroom, there were makeshift ashtrays everywhere, Legitimate glass and porcelain ones numbered in the tens. And beyond that, there were scraps of documents, magazines, and even paper plates imbued with cigarette butts and ash. Though it was clear as day there were no exits in the room, the woman who was in there, passionately arguing on the phone, had vanished. The only trace of anyone in there, in recent being the smoldering remains of a cigarette in an ashtray on the far corner of the room, atop a desk. Its trail of smoke filtering against the ceiling. We were both incredibly confused, though I, at least internally, seemed to process a good bit better as a similar disappearance had occurred right in front of my eyes earlier on. As weird as it sounded, I had started coming to terms with the notion of tangibility being thrown out the window, and so as my coworker fumbled around with the words struggling to define exactly what had just happened, 
I had already begun looking around. Like I said, the office was gross. Every once white document had been stained yellow in cigarette smoke. Many covered in ashes or stained as if the paper was used to put out cigarettes that weren't burning hot enough to set the page ablaze. From what I could tell, the majority of it was invoices regarding materials only identifiable by serial numbers that I couldn't read. What I could very well make out though were the dates. The age of the paper was obvious, with the newest stamp that I could find being from early 2010. Though most were much older, I sorted through them, becoming dissuaded quickly as a silverfish that had been presumably snacking on the pages scuttled out from between them. I inhaled sharply, realizing that aroma of perfume that I'd noticed a few times before had been stinking up the room under the mask of cigarettes. Though, admittedly, I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. After verbally searching for a logical explanation and finding nothing, my coworker uttered that this was way too freaky and that we should leave. I agreed, but just before I did, I noticed a device sitting on top of one of those stacks of documents, an old Blackberry. At the time, I didn't know what era it was from. What I did find interesting was the glass over the presumable LCD having a hefty crack in it, as if it had been smashed. I would have assumed it was the phone we heard the woman talking on moments prior, were it not for the thick layer of dust coating it and everything else in the room. As all my cognition pointed to, nobody had used it at any point in the last decade, and so I decided to pocket it. I wasn't really sure why, but I felt drawn to the outdated device. We both left then, with him turning off the lights that had been on for a very long time on our way out. My coworker locked the door, and we both mutually agreed to talk on our next shift about it, as we were much too tired that early morning to bother trying to rationalize what had just occurred. I finished off the trash run I'd been in the middle of before, then heading out for the day. Just as I walked off campus, I took the Blackberry I had taken out of my pocket, eagerly trying the power button. Of course, it didn't turn on. Something was really driving me to access the phone. Though, I couldn't explain it, but somehow I knew its contents had information that I needed to see. So as I got home, I looked through my cable stuff shoeboxes to see if I could find something that matched the charging port. Eventually I did. I came to learn it was a micro USB connector, like the ones you'd use for older Androids. So I connected it to one of the USB ports on my PC. A conscious decision, because I didn't know if the voltage from the wall could harm the device and let it rest for a moment before I once again held the power button. Amazingly, he decided to boot, showing me first a branded image of its presumed carrier before it gave me a message that the SIM card wasn't detected. I skipped through that though. I knew if there was anything interesting on that device at all, it'd be in two places, the text messages or the camera roll. The former was entirely devoid of content, possibly due to the SIM being removed. But the latter had a singular photo for me to view. It was her, the woman we'd been seeing. She was dressed just as I seen her, in an open white lab coat. A man who was a good bit taller than her had his arms wrapped around her, hugging her tightly. I didn't recognize him at all, though he was wearing a facility's uniform just like my own. Evidently, he'd worked in the department I was in at some point in the past. The photo was just outside one of the campus buildings that I recognized, though the entrance was still in construction, indicating to me that the photo was just as old as a phone. My next shift, when I returned to the campus, I decided that I was going to put the phone back. Something about that picture exuded a certain finality, like a museum piece, and I felt odd having it. But before I did so, I decided to show my coworker. At first, they were a little upset that I didn't tell them about the phone the day prior, but they did start to enjoy the novelty of the photo. Then, they pointed out something interesting that I hadn't quite picked up on the previous day. The man in the photo looked a good bit like me. After I returned the device and left the strange office, I never saw the woman again. Neither did my coworker, at least not up until they quit. I wish I could end this lengthy story with a conclusion that makes sense, but I really can't. I've stopped trying to figure out what she was and how she disappeared from right in front of me so many times. What I am curious about, though, is what she wanted, 
Whether or not she intended for me to find that phone and the photograph, I'm unsure. Part of me wonders if she appeared to me because I looked like the man in it. Perhaps he was a friend or a lover. I guess I'll never know for sure. The sole person I've told this tale to, my partner, seemed positive that the woman was a restless spirit of sorts. Someone long past who decided to manifest once more because of my similarity to someone she cared about. Whether or not I choose to believe that, if it's true, then I do hope that woman has found her closure. Some days, I do wish I could know more, but that strange office and its surrounding floor had been condemned for months now, and as far as I know, the last traces of her and her work have been removed in the process of renovation. Night Shift Nutcase from Alley Cat Disclaimer This story is not mine. It's a story from a friend who has given me permission to send it to bring attention for all young women working night shift. When I was a freshman in college, I had a weekend job working for a local sandwich shop next to a liquor shop in the far corner of my town. I hated that job, but I was only working evenings there to make some extra money to help pay for my own food and necessities to get me through college. The customer seemed friendly enough, I guess, and my co-workers were alright as well. They were fun and interesting people, but my boss was a real jerk. I was lucky I didn't have to see him that often, because he was only around during the mornings. Yet he'd always seem to find a way to make my day more stressful when he was there. My boss would constantly remind us that our shop was losing money and not meeting the profit amount that a business should be making to survive. He would even use it as a threat to scare us, saying that he would have to start cutting hours, and he might even have to let some of us go. However, most of us were used to these kinds of empty threats. We knew not to take him too seriously. Heck, it was even unlikely that he would ever get his own hands dirty and actually help us on a closing shift. I usually had a co-worker with me until about an hour before closing, something that I was always really grateful for. That changed after minimum wage went up. My boss figured he'd save the money he was losing by cutting everyone's hours. So instead of working with someone until 8pm, I would be alone from 6pm until we closed at 10pm. This change worried both my mother and boyfriend at the time. They didn't really like the thought of me being left alone for that long. I was a young woman. I've always been sort of petite and short. I wasn't too thrilled about it either, but what could I do? I needed that job. I dreaded the following weekend when the new schedule would be in effect. On Friday, my boyfriend agreed to stay with me until we closed, but on Saturday he couldn't, and so I begrudgingly made my way to work at 3 p.m. that day. I had a coworker with me until 6 p.m., and they clocked out and left. I was left all alone then for the closing shift, hoping that I'd be lucky and it would be a slow night. For a while there, I thought I did have luck on my side. Not a lot of people were coming in, except for a few regulars at the end of what would usually be the dinner rush, which was nothing I couldn't handle. With the spare time I had, I began cleaning up things early, as I knew it would take a lot longer to get everything done without someone else there to help me. I would bring many empty containers to the back room to wash them, returning to the front whenever I'd hear the bell above the door go off, signaling that a customer had just walked in. This went on for a couple of hours, and I hated every moment of it. At one point, I was in the back, trying to finish washing some dishes, when I heard the bell above the door go off. I glanced at the clock. We would be closing in just half an hour, so this was the point in my shift when I truly despised getting any customers. I finished rinsing the bowl I was washing, then reached for a paper towel, walking to the front to greet the unwanted customer. Much to my surprise, there was no one there. I didn't see any cars out front either. I did a quick look around the shop before returning to the back. 
Whoever it was, maybe they just decided they didn't want anything. Not that I really minded. A couple of minutes passed, and I heard the bell above the door go off again. I briskly walked to the front, expecting a customer to be standing there looking at the menu. But when I got there, there was no one at the counter, no one reading the menu. But what I did see this time was a dirty, homeless-looking man. He sat at the far end of the shop at the back table. From what I could see of him, he had scraggly hair and mud all over his pants and shoes, which he had now tracked inside all over the floor, which I had just cleaned. I was a bit annoyed at this, now knowing that I would have to re-mop the floors. I approached him with caution. Despite my irritation, I greeted the man. Hello, sir. Are you waiting on someone or wanting a minute to look over the menu? He kept looking back and forth from wall to wall and occasionally out the window, ignoring me entirely. He almost appeared disoriented, but he would pull his phone out of his pocket to look at it every now and then. I repeated myself, but once more he didn't respond to my question. My irritation was steadily growing. I waited for a response and got none. He just kept looking everywhere and anywhere but towards me. With an exasperated sigh, I walked to the back room and began to prepare the mop bucket, filling it with water and cleaner. This probably only took about five minutes. Once it was ready, I wheeled it toward the front and quickly noticed that the man was no longer there. Now, he couldn't have left the store because I would have heard the bell on the door go off if the door had been opened. I grabbed my mop and looked toward the ground, where I then noticed the set of muddy footprints leading toward the bathroom door. Great, I thought. Now I'd have to mop the bathroom again, too. I sighed and began mopping the trail leading toward the table where the man had sat, then all the way toward the bathrooms. As I finished cleaning the floor directly in front of the door, I heard the faint, muffled cries of someone on the other side. It almost sounded like sobbing. I leaned in until my ear was almost against the door itself and listened closely. I could hear this man's quiet sobs and muffled mumbling, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. What on earth was going on in there? I knocked lightly on the door, then said, Uh, sir? Is everything all right in there? I was surprised then by the sound of the door being unlocked. Immediately, I jumped away with my mop in hand. I was a good couple of feet away when he opened the door. The man emerged and stood there for a couple of moments, and he finally saw me standing there. He looked me straight in the eyes, and this sent a chill down my spine. I held on to that mop nervously, almost defensively. His stare was blank, emotionless, and yet somehow sorrowful. He didn't say anything. Instead, he briskly walked out the front entrance, setting off the bell. I turned, and I saw him make his way down the road, not once looking back. Just my luck, I thought, that one of the frequent loafers from the liquor store next door would come in on a night I had to work alone. Even though it still didn't shake my anxiety, I took a deep breath, loosening my grip on the mop and looking back toward the bathroom door. I reached for the handle and slowly opened the door, quickly peering around inside before actually entering. Inside, I found a muddy mess all over the floor, as though the man had been pacing in circles in the bathroom. I quickly mopped it up and turned to leave when I noticed the trash can lid was on the ground beside it. I reached for it, bending over the trash can itself in order to retrieve it, when I happened to notice something shining inside. I reached in and retrieved an opened switchblade. It felt as if my whole body had been drenched in cold water. The sudden realization of what this was and what that man could have done to me hit me faster than a bolt of lightning all his strange behavior. There were no other things in that trash can, and I knew that couldn't have been there from before, 
because I had previously cleaned both bathrooms and gathered the trash a little over an hour ago. Shaking, I closed up early that night. I didn't finish washing the dishes, and I didn't bother sweeping or mopping the back room. I just locked the door, put the food away, counted my drawer, and left. I quit the next day. I told my mom about what happened, and she called the police. I gave them my description of the guy as well as the knife, but no identification was ever made. My mom still freaks out about it, although now I'm a grown woman with a family of my own. I don't go out alone as often as I did back then, and I still feel a bit nervous every day. I wonder about that man sometimes, but in all honesty, I don't think I want to know what his plans were before he apparently changed his mind. I'd rather label him in my mind as just plain crazy, and I hope he was given or found the help that he needed. One thing I do know is that when my daughter becomes of age, I'll never let her work a closing shift like I had to for her own protection. There was no fire. From Residential Nightmares I was working at a substance use treatment center for teenagers. It wasn't in a particularly safe part of town, and many of the teenagers were involved in gang life and had come from jail. For reference, I was a young female who, up until that point, had no experience working in an area like that. I had quite a few experiences while working there, some supernatural, some not. The girls' unit was definitely haunted, and working night shifts on that side was always interesting, usually unsettling. Noises of any kind at two in the morning were never welcomed. I was also forced to stand in the middle of many fights, both boys and girls, hoping beyond hope I could get them to de-escalate before I became bruised and bloodied. One of these stressful events involved one of the kids that was a member of one of the legit gangs in the area. I won't say the name to not give away the location. He had broken his hand the day before, and we had to take him to the doctor to get it x-rayed. Nothing major happened. It was just the thought of me, a young female, driving around a teenager in his gang territory. However, the experience I'm writing to you about today was much more intense. We were across the street from a known drug house. There were always sketchy people coming and going from there. Some of these people would come onto our property and scare the patients. They used to walk around shining flashlights in and banging on the windows. Most of it happened at night. This particular occasion, it happened right before sunset. Someone had come from a drug deal and was very clearly high, on what I can't be completely sure. He ran to our side of the street, banging on all the doors, screaming about a fire, about a murder. When one of the supervisors opened the door to figure out what in the world was going on, this stranger began to fight the patients. The look in that person's eyes, how angry he was, it was something I definitely won't forget. His pupils were greatly dilated, and he had a crazed look in his eyes. His veins bulged from how tense his whole body was. His words came out in rage. What he was saying sounded like it was meant to warn us about something, but the presentation seemed much more threatening. He was banging on the doors so hard we thought he would break through them. Given that many of the teenagers housed there came from juvie and were trying to get a tough reputation, it was hard to keep them inside, keep them away from that chaos. This man was very determined to get in, and the teenagers were ready for a fight. Police were always late to the scene any time we needed them, so we didn't have high hopes they would be of much help. We managed to get the door shut again, with the man outside and all the patients securely inside. We took them into a different part of the building that was safer. Sure enough, the guy eventually gave up and left. The police showed up a long while later, taking reports. Of course, though, there was no getting the teens to settle down after that. 
so the evening program was pretty much thrown out the window. Just to make it abundantly clear, there was no fire, and if there was a murder, we never heard about it. That guy was clearly just having a bad trip. It's sad to think about now, and I hope he got some help, but in that moment, I was terrified. I have many stories from my time there that had my adrenaline pumping, but that was definitely the scariest. I'm just glad he didn't get the chance to hurt someone, and we never saw him again. The Lady of the House from Sacha H.O. I used to work for a restaurant. It was my first job, and I was about 16. This was an older restaurant that was known for having spirits in almost every part of the building. The restroom was one of the most active places in the building. We used to have customer running from the ladies and men's room, stating someone or something turned the water on and or grabbed their hair or rattling on their stall door with no one standing on the other side. But that's another story for another time. We also had the lady of the house. She used to live in the restaurant before it was changed from a house to a restaurant. She wears a long black Victorian era dress and walks down the stairs and to the kitchen and back upstairs. She was known to hurt the staff of the restaurant. I had an unforgettable encounter with the lady of the house. We were told if you hear or see her, walk the other way or just stay out of her way. I was closing and we weren't allowed to close alone due to the paranormal guest of the restaurant. I was sweeping the main seating area and my colleague was in the storage room. We had music on and just wanted to get the place clean so we could go home. I had my back turned to the staircase that led upstairs when the room suddenly got colder, so I asked my colleague if she'd turn the air down, thinking that I was just standing under a vent. She shouted back, No, I'm still in storage, why? I said, It just feels really cold all of a sudden in the main room. She came out and let out a blood-curdling scream. I turned around to see the lady of the house standing right behind me. My colleague ran out of the front room, leaving me standing in shock to this terrifying yet elegant specter. She reached her hand out and grabbed my shoulder, leading me to the kitchen with her. I was in shock and trying to figure out what she wanted me to do. She pointed at this antique tea set that we kept behind the glass in the kitchen for our top customers. I made her the tea and stood back, I tried to sneak out the kitchen door slowly. She turned and screamed this ear-piercing scream that dropped me to my knees, all while covering my ears, trying to make sure they wouldn't bleed. When I looked up, she was right there, so close to my face and so cold. She screamed again and raised her hands as if to hit me, and when she came in contact with my upper arm, she left claw marks that bled a little, then just disappeared. My coworker came back in with our manager, who lived down the road. They found me sitting in the kitchen door crying and rocking back and forth. They bandaged me up and my colleague drove me home. I quit working there a little after this encounter with the lady of the house. Let's just say, if you ever eat at a restaurant with the picture of the lady of the house by the front door, do not go alone. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com.